Welcome to the California Hall of Fame. Please find your seat. Our program will begin momentarily. Welcome to the California Hall of Fame. Please find your seat. Our program will begin momentarily. Welcome to the California Hall of Fame. Please find your seat. Our program will begin momentarily.
please welcome California Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber. Well, good evening. One more time. Good evening. All right, I love that, I love that. I'm Dr. Shirley Weber, California Secretary of State. And it is, it is truly, truly my honor to welcome you to the California Hall of Fame ceremony. We are pleased to host you as our, at this very beautiful Marge Fong Yu California Secretary of State Complex. And here in California, Sacramento, California. We're very honored because that name in itself, Marge Fong Yu, uh, is a symbol of excellence and progressive activity for women in the state of California. As your Secretary of State, I serve as one of the trustees of the California Museum, and my office works closely with the museum on a regular basis. They're focused on the history and contributions of marginalized communities while celebrating California's rich history and diversity serves as an important role in our state. Following tonight's ceremony, we encourage you to explore the legacies of the 15th class of California Hall of Fame inductees in the exhibit here at the California Museum and the inductees' accomplishments are added as a permanent record to the California State Archives. I wanna thank the governor and his wife, as well as California Museum, Board of Museum Leadership for your work to select and organize tonight's important event. Established in 2006 by former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and First Lady Marie Shriver, the California Hall of Fame honors individuals who embody California's innovative spirit and have made significant contributions to their fields. Tonight's 15th class of inductees is the first living class since its creation in 2006. Over 135 individuals have been inducted into the California Hall of Fame. And tonight we look forward to the 15th class joining this illustrious group. I would like to welcome and extend to our sincere, and our sincere congratulations to tonight's inductees, including Linda Carter, Roy Choi, Stephen Chu, Peggy Fleming, Arlie Ruch, uh, Russell Hauschauer, uh, Alonzo King, Barbara Morgan, Megan Rapineau, Linda Ronstadt, Ed Russia, and Los Tigres de Norte. Your contributions to your fields and your commitment to your community and your passion and your leadership have truly made a difference. You have inspired a new generation of Californians to dream big, be innovative, and work toward their goals. I want to thank you for joining us this evening, and I welcome you to the March Fong Yu Complex. Thank you. Please welcome President and CEO of Visit California, Carolyn Batetta. Good evening, everyone. I am so honored to be here alongside so many friends and distinguished guests to celebrate two Hall of Fame classes. While so much of our daily lives have returned to normal, some moments make you realize how far we've come. After a few years of postponed Hall of Fame ceremonies, it's particularly special to be back together tonight. At Visit California, our mission is to inspire travel to the Golden State. Travel offers a window to the world. And in California, we welcome all people, all cultures, and all dreams. We thank and appreciate our Hall of Famers. Their voices matter. There's a direct correlation between their inspiring stories and how the world sees California. Their boldness uplifts residents and visitors alike. Just yesterday, I heard from partners across the state. Literally billions of dollars are being invested into our communities in the form of new attractions and amenities. I'd also like to thank our governor and first partner for continuing this great tradition and celebrating the best of California. Visit California has been a proud, longtime sponsor of this institution that showcases what's possible in the Golden State. It's my privilege to celebrate 
with all of you and honoring these incredible inductees. Congratulations to all of them. Have a good evening, everyone. Join us in welcoming California Museum Board Vice Chair, Kristen Soares. Thank you. On behalf of the California Museum, welcome to the 15th Annual California Hall of Fame Induction Ceremony. Thank you for being here tonight. It is wonderful, as Carolyn said, to be able to celebrate in person again. I'd like to acknowledge some special guests in the audience, Sacramento Mayor Daryl Steinberg, a good friend of the museum while he was at the state capitol and now in the mayor's office, the Honorable Jose Medina. Thank you. Members of the governor's staff, other administration officials, distinguished guests, and friends and previous Hall of Fame inductees and their families, Flores Huerta, social, <laughs> social activist, co-founder of the United Farm Workers, member of the seventh class. Arlene Bloom, scientist and mountaineer, member of the 12th class. Lisa Demetrios, granddaughter of Charles and Ray Eames. Stephen Graham, son of Robert Graham, who created the medals that will be awarded this evening. Robert Warren, son of Governor Earl Warren. And Victoria Yeager, wife of General Chuck Yeager. And joining us tonight are family and friends of the 14th class of inductees who will be recognized later in this program. Tonight, we will discover the inspirational stories of people who have dared to dream. They've made their mark from the stage to the stars and everywhere in between. But what unites them is California. Here, everything, anything is possible. And these remark as these remarkable individuals have shown. The California Hall of Fame is a museum signature event and part of our primary mission to educate and inspire the next generation of leaders. Since the first person, last in-person Hall of Fame, we opened the permanent exhibit Women Inspire in collaboration with the first partner, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, and presented many temporary exhibits. Also, yes. <laughs> Also during the pandemic, we initiated virtual programming that reached students across the state and even around the world. And we will continue with this online outreach while also welcoming back in-person field trips. And it is wonderful to hear the sounds of students and children's again in our museum. I mentioned these initiatives because while tonight may be glamorous, we're able to do this important work throughout the year because of tonight's sponsors, and I'd like to thank them. There is our presenting sponsor, Visit California, whom we just heard from. Also, Cruz, PG&E, Pharma, Southern California Edison, and many more here tonight. And I also want to mention our museum board chair, Anne Marie Petrie who was supposed to be standing here at this podium right now and unfortunately was not able to attend tonight. Anne-Marie, if you are watching, actually I know you are watching, we miss you and are so appreciative for your dedication and steadfast leadership of the museum board. And I'd also like to recognize the museum's board of trustees, if you would please stand up. Thank you. And I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of the museum staff, especially Amanda Sanchez, Peter Van Dyke, Serena Roberts, and of course, Amanda Meeker, our museum director, our fabulous museum director. And finally, thank you to the governor 
and First Partners teams, especially Becca Prouda, Rebecca Sterling, I'm sorry, Becca Prouda, Rebecca Sterling, and Abby Prismich for all the effort they have put into making tonight so elegant and special. Now, I'd like to introduce tonight's hosts, whose partnership and support we are truly grateful for, and who have made this event their own. Please welcome to the stage our own Governor Gavin Newsom and first partner Jennifer Siebel Newsom. Everybody, we'll get moving. But I just want to, first of all, thank you all very much for taking the time to be here. And, you know, I, I've been, you know, I took a little time as I was driving back from Southern California today to think about and forgive me a little personal uh, reflection on the journey that I've had in the last five days. It's brought me to Northern California, Wairica, into Southern California at the border. Actually, it was on the other side of the border in Mexicali yesterday. I was up in Wairica announcing with the Yorok. Uh, and Kuroke tribes, the two largest indigenous tribes here uh, in California. I was announcing the largest river restoration and dam removal project in U.S. history, and we did so because of the courage and the persistence of the leadership of the two tribes. It was a point of pride. It was a point of reflection uh, about, you know, our past and how imperfect it has been, don't forget, it was the first governor of the state of California in a state of the state address in 1851, Governor Burnett, that announced in that first state of the state address the war of extermination against native peoples. We continue to reconcile that past and a big part of that river restoration was about what makes, I think, California a special place. But the meetings I had yesterday in Mexicali on the other side of the border also remind me of what makes California great. And I'm gonna pull this together very briefly. I had the privilege, <laughs> I had the privilege of meeting with the governor of Baja in Mexicali at a migrant facility. And I met with three families, one uh, remarkable family that came from Haiti. They started their journey in January an eight-year-old boy, a husband and wife, leaving behind their 13-year-old daughter. They made their way through the jungles of Panama in January and just arrived last week in Mexicali, coming here for new beginnings. I met a family from Guatemala, four young kids and a young man, their father, who had lost his eyesight in an industrial accident and was told the only place that he can get the medical care so he can see again and see his young kids was California. I met another family, two beautiful young girls, a four and a five-year-old girl, and forgive me, sexually assaulted by their father, and the wife rushing to the border for new beginnings. And it's a reminder of what makes this place a special place. And it's a reminder, a sober reminder of the humility that we place on moments like this because in so many ways, those stories and all the stories, countless stories that we tell, um, you know, are what make California dream real. Remember, there's only two dreams. There's the American dream and the California dream. There's no other state, no other state that attaches itself to the dream. And, and so, I guess I'm here, and my job's just to introduce Jen. Uh, I'm here in that spirit with deep pride, deep pride and humility uh, of the journey that we're all on together and how we have a responsibility to one another to right wrongs, to you know, soften the edges, to still a sense of well-being, but continue to be that dream factory. You know, this is a state with more scientists, more researchers, more engineers, more Nobel laureates. You'll meet one tonight than any other state in the nation. This is a state, I, I said this a moment ago in a smaller reception, I said, you know, not only are we the largest state 
in our union, but we're the most diverse state in the world's most diverse democracy. And what I think makes this state great and what's reflected tonight, as it consistently has been in the 138 people that we have been able to recognize and celebrate, is that the folks that are here truly do represent the best of this state, but they represent the diversity of this state. And in that diversity comes our strength. We don't tolerate that diversity, we celebrate that diversity. And you'll see that again on display tonight. Final words. This journey, this journey over the last five days also ended when I was tuning in to President Biden signing the same-sex marriage bill today. And what a pleasure it is, you'll hear in a moment from Jen, that we're recognizing Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin. I had the privilege of marrying them in 2004 with 4,035 other couples from 46 states and six countries around the world that came to San Francisco City Hall for the winter, not summer, of love in February 2004. And it's just a reminder of this remarkable journey that we've been on. So that's my selfish five days. Uh, but it's also a reflection, I think, uh, of components of what makes all our days in this journey here in California so special. So in the spirit of one of my heroes, Jerry Garcia, I will say this of every one of the inductees as I introduce Jen. Jerry said this about the Grateful Dead. He said, you don't want to be the best of the best. You want to be the only one that does what you do. Think about that in the context of our honorees tonight, the 14th and 15th class of the Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, my wife, Jennifer Siebel Newsom. Thank you, dear, for the lovely introduction. You can just stay over there while we get started. <laughs> Bienvenidos a todos. And thank you so much for being here with us. Um, I can tell from all the smiling faces in the audience that you are as thrilled as I am to be back in person in the magnificent California Museum to help us celebrate in person the Hall of Fame with our 15th annual California Hall of Fame. Each year, the governor and I have the pleasure of honoring a new class of individuals who through their creativity, innovation, leadership, and advocacy have embodied what makes California so great and so special. And when I think about the inductees of the 15th class, I'm reminded of the importance, surprise, surprise, of partnership and community. Like all of us, these remarkable individuals could not have risen to the heights that they have on their own. Each of tonight's honorees have a village, whether large or small, a family, friends, educators, coaches, mentors, and partners, a community that has encouraged them along the way, built them up, and at their lowest moments, consoled them, advised them, and reminded them that they had the capacity to soar beyond their wildest imagination. And I know that there are members of those villages with us here tonight. So as we celebrate the brilliant athletes, artists, leaders, and advocates in the 15th class of the California Hall of Fame, I encourage all of you to think about your own villages, your own partnerships, and your own communities. And remember, that greatness is possible when we invest not just in ourselves, but in each other. Tonight is particularly special because, yes, as was mentioned, we get to celebrate two classes. But be so before we meet the 15th class, we're going to take some time to honor the remarkable individuals of the 14th class. Because even when the pandemic made it impossible to be together, the governor and I insisted that we honor trailblazing Californians who are no longer with us. So with the help of all of our partners, we thought outside of the box and tried something new, this virtual California Hall of Fame ceremony. And it was a wonderful way to share the inspirational life stories of an entire posthumous class 
of California heroes. Let's take a look back at the lives of the six extraordinary individuals who made up the 14th class of the California Hall of Fame. The work of pioneering artist Ruth Asawa has been exhibited in museums and collections around the world since the 1950s. Her later years were largely dedicated to teaching art to young people at the San Francisco High School that bears her name. But when she was in high school herself, she and 120,000 Japanese Americans fell victim to Executive Order 9066 and were imprisoned in camps. When she regained her freedom, Ruth followed her passion to become a leading light of the post-war modernist scene. Her looped wire sculptures have captured imaginations ever since. Jerry Garcia was a rock star and a central figure in San Francisco's legendary music scene. One of the most successful performers of his era, he played guitar and sang for over 30 years, primarily with the Grateful Dead and the Jerry Garcia Band. Jerry moved people to come together, to feel joy, to dance, to celebrate, just as we celebrate him today. By standing up for the rights of Filipino farm workers, Larry Itliong ignited the 1965 Delano Grape Strike and helped found the United Farm Workers Union. The strike resulted in one of the most important victories in the history of American labor. Although the spotlight usually fell on Cesar Chavez, history has begun to acknowledge Larry Itliong's critical role in the struggle for farm workers' rights. And so do we. Richie Valens released his first single at the age of 17 and quickly became one of the biggest stars of early rock and roll. His next record would change music forever. La Bamba inspired countless musicians and heralded the coming of the Chicano rock movement. Richie died in a tragic plane crash when he was only a teenager. He had so much more music to give the world but we remember him today for what he accomplished in such a short but dazzling lifetime. Finally, we celebrate two people who remind us that at the heart of the California story is an enduring passion for equality. When then Mayor of San Francisco, Gavin Newsom, opened the door to gay marriage in 2004, Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin became the first same-sex couple to legally wed in the United States. It was a simple declaration of love, honoring a 50-year-long relationship, and also the culmination of decades spent fighting for equality. Lyon and Martin were pioneers and leaders in the LGBTQ plus rights movement. Do you, Phyllis, take this woman, Del, to be your lawful wedded spouse? I do. do you My husband had the pleasure of officiating their second wedding after the California Supreme Court finally recognized marriage equality in 2008. So as we've just seen, the 14th class of the California Hall of Fame reflects so much of what is so special about California, our cre creativity, our love of freedom, our commitment to equality, our resilience, and our fierce defiance in the face of oppression. Can the loved ones of this stellar class please stand as we pay homage to Ruth Asawa, Jerry Garcia, Larry Itliong, Richie Valens, and Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon for their lasting legacy on California and the world.
Thank you for being with us tonight. And now it's time to meet the 15th class of the California Hall of Fame. Renowned Norteño band Los Tigres del Norte joining us tonight are Jorge Hernandez, Hernan Hernandez, Eduardo Hernandez, and Luis Hernandez. Legendary soccer player, Megan Rapino. Iconic contemporary artist, Ed Ruscha. History-making teacher and astronaut, Barbara Morgan. Visionary choreographer, Alonzo King. Esteemed sociologist and author, Dr. Arlie Russell Hochschild. Nobel Prize winning physicist, Dr. Stephen Chu. Olympic gold medal figure skater, Peggy Fleming. Celebrated chef, Roy Choi. Treasured singer, Linda Ronstadt. Many of us were lucky enough to grow up with Linda Carter as a role model. Best known for winning Our Hearts as Wonder Woman, a character she infused with such power, humor, and grace that has become one of the most iconic characters in television history. When I was a child, watching that spin as she turned into Wonder Woman, wielding her golden lasso and those indestructible bracelets, helped me tap into my own strength during some of the hardest times in my childhood. She showed me and an entire generation of women and girls that if you can see it, you can be it. For that, I am beyond grateful. The granddaughter and daughter of Mexican immigrants, Linda is also a talented singer and songwriter whose music and lyrics have been showcased throughout the country and the world. Continuing to embody her values and strength on and off the screen, Linda has been an advocate of reproductive freedom and the LGBTQ community. And unfortunately, Linda couldn't join us for the rest of this ceremony, but please join me in celebrating our very first honoree, Linda Carter. Chef Roy Choi was born in Seoul, South Korea, and raised in Southern California, where he lives today. Oh. Roy is known as an architect of the modern food truck movement, a movement that brings together food, culture, and community, making space for people to nourish their minds, their bodies, and their souls. Roy's Kogi style food is world famous for a reason. It's a delicious representation of the cultural fabric of California, something the governor and I have made a priority to uphold. In addition to being a vocal advocate for street food culture, past, present, and future, Roy is a best-selling author, an award-winning chef, an acclaimed restaurateur, and host of The Chef Show with Jean Favreau, as well as the Emmy award-winning series, Broken Bread. It is my great honor to introduce the phenomenally talented Roy Choi. Hello. Uh, hold up a minute. I'm in the same museum as Lucille Ball and Bruce Lee. <laughs> Man, my seven-year-old self is tripping out right now. Um, I just want to say thank you. This is, uh, you know, the story of immigrants coming to this country in the state with no money in their pockets. You know, I'm a product of that, and, uh, you know, everything that this represents, it represents street food culture, represents 
those of us that grew up with parents that have to work graveyard shifts, you know, uh, communities where resources are stripped away, people, uh, taqueros on the streets, you know, it, it just represents everything, you know, the voices that are kind of silenced in this country and, you know, the, the for those of us that have to struggle through and make it in this world. And uh, there's going to be little kids that grow up in the future now, they're going to see that they can make it. So thank you all. I bet everyone here can remember when Megan Rapino delivered the U.S. one of the biggest moments in soccer history. <laughs> Picture this. It's overtime against Brazil during the quarterfinals of the 2011 World Cup, and she sends a 50-yard wonder cross to Abby Wambach, who scores the equalizer goal that saves the day and becomes the catalyst for the U.S. Women's National Women's Soccer Team World Cup win. It was an amazing moment. <laughs> and an example of Megan's tremendous skill as well as her unflappable leadership. Originally from Reading, Megan has been tremendous off the field as well. She's an outspoken advocate for LGBTQ rights, racial justice, and gender equity, joining fellow women's national soccer team players in a successful lawsuit for equal pay against the US Soccer Federation. A brave move that gave renewed energy to the equal pay movement, broadly speaking. President Biden even awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom for her work. <laughs> Megan has also been recognized as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. She has written a New York Times best-selling memoir, and she has won far too many soccer championships, medals, and accolades to list. My personal admiration for Megan is probably pretty obvious. She's inspired generations of young people and used her celebrity to fight for equality for everyone. Please welcome the global icon, Megan Rapino. Still, I'm from Europe. I'm like, my little kid's freaking out too. I'm like, what is happening? Yeah, and the same thing as Wonder Woman. Like, what is happening here? Uh, it's wild. Um, I mean, first of all, thank you to to you two um, for allowing me to be here and to honoring me um, with this. It's just absolutely incredible. Um, I want to thank my family that's here, my mom and my dad, my niece, and my partner Sue. Even though she's from New York, I'm like. <laughs> We, it's, it's an ongoing fight. Obviously, California is the best. Um, yeah. Got to get my dig in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it really, truly is an honor. Um, I love being from California. Um, being from such a progressive state, um, from issues at the border to trans rights, um, to allowing trans kids to play in sports, to LGBTQ rights, this is the state that I feel like the whole world really looks to, frankly, um, as a beacon of light and hope and progress and equality. And I think everybody up here speaks to that. So it's um, such an honor um, to be able to accept this award. And uh, I just want to thank everyone. Congratulations to all the other honorees. Um, the best part was being able to chat with all of you guys and getting to know everybody a little bit. Um, just uh, an incredibly interesting group of people and so, so very accomplished. So I'm very thankful to be in this class with everyone and thank you to everyone here. And I don't want to be rude and jet out, but I do have to catch a flight. So we will be leaving, but thank you so much for this honor. Thank you to the two of you. Uh, much love. Alonzo King is an indelible artist whose work literally gets under your skin and stays with you. 
He challenges audiences to look past the expected, transforming their perception. An award-winning visionary artist, Alonzo King founded the Lions Ballet in San Francisco in 1982, where he continues to serve as choreographer and artistic director. The New York Times has called him as having astonishing originality, the way he defies gender norms and exposes injustice will forever change how you experience ballet. Alonzo is a provocateur whose work is so spiritual and so deep that I know I, like many others, are moved to tears by its brilliance and beauty. He was named a Master of Choreography by the Kennedy Center and one of America's irreplaceable dance treasures by the Dance Heritage Coalition. His compositions are so ethereal, we couldn't help but share one with you all tonight. Please have a look. <laughs> Whoa! It is my honor to introduce the genius behind it all, a dear friend, Alonzo King. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations to everyone. It's an honor to be up here with all of you. <clears throat> I wasn't able to see the screen, and I'm so glad. Because <laughs> if you ever want to see a critical parent, it's a choreographer looking at his work. <laughs> um, this is a, an incredible honor. And I've been in dance. My mother introduced me to it. She was an amateur, so they call it, but a brilliant one who inspired my life. And we used to work together since I was a child. And I never wanted to stop. One of the transformative experiences that kept me engaged was that I began to see a growth inside myself because K through 12 was destroying me and not encouraging a different way of looking at the world and experiencing it. It was outside and chasing a carrot. But the practice of art taught me to look internally and to dig into caves that I would have never found if I hadn't begun that journey. And it taught me to recognize that everyone has greatness inside of them, regardless of how they look, behave, or appear. And that was a deep lesson. 
And so I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Stephen Chu is a highly accomplished physicist, a prolific science writer, and a brilliant professor. In 1997, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his contributions to laser cooling and atom trapping, work that can be used in space navigation. During the Obama administration, Dr. Chu served as U.S. Secretary of Energy, making him the first scientist to hold a cabinet position. Imagine that. <laughs> I would say we should appoint more scientists like Dr. Chu in government. I think that's a good idea. Dr. Chu is currently an acclaimed professor of physics and pre professor of molecular and cellular physiology at my alma mater, Stanford University. And in addition to his professorships, he holds 21 patents, has published 300 papers, received 35 honorary degrees, and dozens of other awards. It is my honor to introduce this brilliant fellow cardinal Dr. Stephen Chu. <laughs> Don't believe everything you hear. <laughs> when I was growing up in grade school, high school, I was felt like I was the family failure. My older brother, I couldn't hold a candle to. My cousins, I couldn't hold a candle to. And it was like, you know, the black sheep of the family. Um, and so, you know, I joke, but it's, it's true. You know, getting a Nobel Prize only leveled the playing field. <laughs> 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 but it's worse than that, because when I called up my mother, I said, Mom, guess what? I got the Nobel Prize. She says, yeah, 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 when are you going to visit me next? <laughs> Calls me up five hours later and says, Stephen, it's true. You did get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> but anyway, um, it, it, I thank you so much for being part of this great group of people uh, in the same class as all of them, actually, but you know, the Lindas, <laughs> all of them. Um, uh, I'm just thrilled that I get to meet real celebrities. And finally, finally, I have to say that, you know, you know, I came to California to go to graduate school at Berkeley. I went to undergraduate at the University of Rochester, where it's cold and dark. And I got to Berkeley and said, my parents never told me about California. <laughs> I fell in love with the place. And here's where I will stay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up in San Jose, Peggy Fleming didn't start ice skating until she was nine years old. You guys still have a chance. <laughs> she had a natural ability and worked hard to win her first competition within that first year. And that young girl would go on to win a lot. In 1968, Peggy Fleming accomplished what most athletes only dream of. She won the gold medal in figure skating at the Olympic Winter Games in France. In fact, she won the only gold medal for the United States that year. <laughs> On top of Olympic gold, Peggy took home medals at US championships, North American championships, and world championships. And she was even honored by Sports Illustrated as one of seven athletes who changed the game in the 20th century. She was a shero to me personally and to so many young girls, proving that grace and power aren't mutually exclusive and that we too could be athletes. 
She even inspired me to, to take up ice skating lessons. I thought I could be as good. <laughs> Our collective admiration for Peggy Fleming extends beyond her skating prowess to her advocacy off the ice. After beating breast cancer, Peggy began to use her platform to raise awareness about the importance of early detection and regular mammograms. I'm so proud to introduce a woman I would argue is one of the greatest and most graceful athletes of all time, a goat in her own right, Peggy Fleming. The goat. <laughs> Wow, I've never been called the goat. <laughs> um, but that's very cool. Uh, I want to thank the governor and the first partner for uh, inviting me to be inducted into the 15th class of the California Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. I am deeply honored, and I just can't believe this. This is really cool. I was born in San Jose. I was number two of four girls. My dad was a pressman at the San Jose Mercury News, and my mother raised the family. And growing up in California inspired me to find my way to the ice. My parents were the encouragement that I needed. And as I explored all kinds of uh, activities, from music to dance to sports, at first I loved softball and climbing trees. <laughs> and um, until my dad, he took me and my sisters to a local ice rink. And um, we went out and I skated. I went, this is, this is it. This is, this is the sport I want to do. So I started taking lessons. And my first competition was at the rink at Sutro's Baths in San Francisco. That was such a cool place to go. I wasn't nervous at all. And um, I ended up winning. And I went, gosh, this is easy. <laughs> and I thought, well. Three weeks later, I landed, uh, entered the Pacific Coast competition, and I came in dead last. <laughs> but the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, all at nine years of age. <laughs> but <laughs> it didn't um, ruin everything. Um, uh, this really inspired me to do my best. And soon, I, I got the hang of competition, finally. I wanted to be the best. Um, technically and artistically, every single day. Well, fast forward nine years, 1968 uh, Olympic Winter Games in Grenoble. I won the gold medal. And thank you. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> um, and I'm told that my victory uplifted and inspired the spirit of so many Americans who faced the harsh difficulties and challenges of our country in the 1960s. The world embraced my style of skating, and I skated around the world in ice shows and television specials. But one of the most um, memorable um, television special I did, it was called Peggy Fleming Visits the Soviet Union. And it was taped in 1973 during the Cold War and featured American and Russian skaters, performers, and a joint um, video production crew. The special was aired on the same day in the U.S. as it was in Russia, a sign of friendship and opportunity for us all. Um, uh, you know, I, I think we all really learned from that of how, how alike we all are, um, much that we need to do today, too. I was a figure skating commentator for ABC Sports and ESPN for 28 years, and I sought to bring the joy, uh, competitive energy, and the passion of skating to our TV audiences. And then in 1998, I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer, which fortunately was successfully treated. And then I became a spokesperson for women's health. And I encouraged women to be sure you go in for your checkup and your mammogram, and that's the most important thing is to catch it early. Um, it is, I'm grateful. <laughs> My life and involvement with figure skating continues. For the past five years, my husband of 52 years <laughs> um, 
Yeah, that's an accomplishment too. <laughs> Greg and I have sponsored an annual figure skating competition titled the Peggy Fleming Trophy, which showcases and judges artistry and creativity while requiring superb technical skills. I'm very uh, grateful for the love and support that I had from my parents and for the guidance and high standards that was set by my coaches. I truly love California. I, I am a California girl and I appreciate becoming one of the 149 people that have been inducted into the California Hall of Fame. So I thank you. Thank you. So. Dr. Arlie Russell Hochschild is a world-renowned sociologist, author, and professor emerita of sociology at UC Berkeley. She was a pioneer in gender equity work through her research and her book, The Second Shift, which focuses on working parents' struggles to divide housework and childcare. Through this work, she helped give a name to emotional labor and the mental load that so many of us women carry as we juggle multiple jobs and responsibilities at home. I'm personally grateful to Dr. Hoaxchild for her work on invisible labor as it's inspired my advocacy, my films, and my first partner's agenda. It's even led to some pretty interesting conversations in the house. <laughs> Dr. Hoaxchild has also taken an honest and empathetic look at political division in America. Instead of stoking the flames of bigotry and hate, she sought to help us find common ground through important work like her book, Strangers in Their Own Land, Anger and Mourning on the American Right. It's my honor to uplift this award-winning New York Times best-selling author, researcher, and academic who happens to be a giant on whose shoulder I and so many others stand, Dr. Arlie Russell Hoekschild. This is so humbling, and I feel this is being organized kind of like an Al Alonzo King you know, dance. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I feel um, at a moment like this very humble, and like uh, if you put every kind of kindness that I've received uh, in a box under a Christmas tree, you know, in a short period of time, you couldn't see the tree. I, I've, um, and the person that I, uh, speaking personally, I think, um, owe the most to is my husband, Adam, uh, who uh, <laughs> is a, a, an extraordinary writer uh, on his own. But he is... Um, He's my go-to person. He's my where am I going person. He's my <laughs> uh, live it up person. He's my laugh it off person. Um, my together on this earth person. Thank you, Adam. Fifty-seven years <laughs> of good luck. <laughs> And next to him is our son, uh, David, um, who, uh, with extraordinary guidance and inspiring leadership, uh, is um, a chair of the uh, Energy Commission. And my inspiration, because I see how he inspires others. He was the little kid you saw. <laughs> no, reading the Three Bears, what it was. Um, and when he was um, uh, first uh, giving a talk uh, at his inauguration into his position, um, uh, to be, to, to green California for the new vision, the California we want it to be, and it's becoming. Um, at the end of it, there was a guy sitting in back of Adam and I, 
uh, and he said, gosh, you know, what a talk. You know, I was about to retire from the Energy Commission, but now I don't want to anymore. <laughs> uh, and my extraordinary uh, daughter-in-law, Cynthia Lee, I mean, I can't know how <laughs> lucky and blessed I am, who is a doctor, a healer, and uh, extraordinary inspiring, and the author of an amazing book you should read. <laughs> Uh, brave new <laughs> medicine. So a little ad there. But, um, <laughs> but I also feel like I want to thank the people who have shared their stories with me. Uh, I'm a sociologist, but what I really do is listen to people's extraordinary stories of, you know, right wing pipe fitters in Louisiana, uh, but also um, nannies, care workers, and uh, factory workers, um, flight attendants, bill collectors, you name it, I've talked to them. And um, I feel it's such an honor, almost sacred honor, to receive these stories. And um, I hold them. and. What I do with them is to learn from them about the overstory <laughs> that we all live under. So all of this has happened in California. <laughs> and uh, both Adam and I came from the East, but hey, we're not going anywhere. And, and I hope no one else is either. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Our next honoree is truly out of this world. Born in Fresno, Barbara Morgan's life would take her on an unbelievable journey that led to her becoming the first teacher in space. I mean, as a teacher, she's already our hero, but she literally went above and beyond to become a NASA astronaut. It all began... <laughs> It all began in 1985 when Barbara was selected as the backup candidate for the NASA Teacher in Space program. Following the horrifically tragic loss of the entire Space Shuttle Challenger crew in 1986, Barbara bravely assumed the role of Teacher in Space designee. And then in 1998, Barbara reported to the Johnson Space Center to begin training to become a full-time astronaut. In 2007, she finally made her journey to space on the space shuttle Endeavour, where she operated the robotic arms to install hardware on the International Space Station, and even conducted lessons for school children back home. <laughs> Not surprising coming from a dedicated school teacher. How about we pause and listen to Barbara speak to a class of students while in space? Uh, How many years did you train to become an astronaut? Over. Hi, Brian. Well, I started my training here. I've been involved with NASA for over 20 years, but I started my training uh, as an astronaut about nine years ago when I, my last class of students at McCall, they were third graders at the time, and they finished third grade. I finished that third grade year. And then um, when they graduated from high school just this past year, so it's been that long of a time. And it's all been a lot of fun, just like teaching. This is Weston. How did your body feel during the launch? Over. During the launch, your body feels, uh, first of all, there's just a lot of shaking going on. You don't feel a lot at first. And then the G-forces get more and more. Um, and finally, at the very end, when you get about three Gs, it gets pretty tough to breathe, so you feel like somebody's kind of standing on your chest. Over. <laughs> I'm not sure I can handle that. It is my distinct honor to introduce a real-life astronaut and role model to so many, the courageous Barbara Morgan.
Thank you, Governor Newsom and First Partner for honoring all of us. This is really tremendous, thanks. And greetings, Earthlings. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a very short story to share with you from the Challenger days. Pilot Mike Smith took me on my first, most exciting flights I had ever had in my life, and that was in the NASA's high-performance T-38 T38 jet trainers. So we were uh, we took off really fast down in Houston and uh, flew over Houston at 500 miles an hour. And you're in this wonderful glass cockpit, and the view was tremendous. And I said, Mike, this is an amazing view. And he said, well, here's a better one for you. But before he finished getting the words out of his mouth, he flipped the plane upside down. <laughs> so suddenly, those uh, green bayous of Texas were in uh, above me, and the blue sky was beneath me. And uh, Mike gave me a whole new perspective. And then we continued flying out over the Gulf of Mexico, where he showed me how to do barrel rolls and T-38s and fly in formation with uh, Krista and, um, and our commander, Dick Scobie. And then all of a sudden, I hear, hear over my earphones, okay, Barbara, push the stick. And I said, which way? And he said, push the stick any way you want. Just take it and see what happens. And I was, um, so I took the stick and uh, flew a whole bunch of barrel rolls and high sweeping arcs over the Gulf of Mexico. And Mike, um, it, before the flight, Mike had a lot of confidence in me that I did not have before the flight. <laughs> so I wasn't sure about the uh, oxygen mask or the ejection seat, but he gave me that confidence and he opened up a whole new world of opportunities to me. All of our young people, every single one of them, has great potential. And what I try to do is carry those lessons that I learned from Mike and from all the fantastic public school teachers that I had growing up in Fresno, California, and all the other folks um, here that I learned so much from, and try to provide opportunities for our young people to have, uh, to be able to get new perspectives, to learn some confidence, and, um, for them to learn and realize that for every single one of them, the sky is no limit. Thanks. Imagine the most beautiful sky during a gorgeous California sunset and upon it the words, a particular kind of heaven. Well, that image was created by Ed Ruscha, our next honoree, and you can e even catch a glimpse of the artwork in the courtyard. This dynamic, award-winning, LA-based artist's work closely observes American reality with a strong nod to California. A pioneer throughout his career, Ed was extremely influential in the rise of the iconic pop art movement of the 1960s. His work is both provocative and accessible, and it's deadpan California contemporary cool. He uses familiar pop cultural images, including Hollywood and other landscapes, and combines them all with a unique use of typography and materials. For over 50 years, Ed has used his art to speak to the ever-changing world around him, with Southern California as both his muse and his backdrop. Ed is considered to be one of the world's most important artists, and the governor and I couldn't agree more. We love Ed's work so much, we actually have a piece hanging in the governor's office. It's my great pleasure to introduce a legend, a California hero, Ed Ruscha. I can't claim to be a um, native son, but I wish I could. And um, I'm actually from Oklahoma, and um, I'm an Okie that 
drove to California after reading John Steinbeck and William Saroyan and, and seeing Grapes of Wrath. And when I got out here, I was stunned by um, the accelerating culture that I found. And it was amazing. There was everything in California was in forward motion. And it blew my hair back. I loved it. And um, I've been here ever since. And uh, the wheels just keep working, keep working. I'm just glad I'm along for the ride. And, uh, you know, we've all put our pedals to the metal, and now we've got gold medals to prove it. <laughs> so thank you very much. And when the night wind starts to sing a lonesome lullaby, it helps to think we're sleeping underneath the same big sky. Whew. <laughs> you are angelic. Linda Ronstadt's angelic, angelic voice and talent <laughs> made the gorgeous words of this song somewhere out there a hit in 1986. And she indirectly saved kids like me who sang her words over and over again to find solace in dark times. A treasured singer and pioneer of the California folk rock movement for over four decades, whew, Linda has received international acclaim for her voice and songs, all while embracing her Mexican German heritage and culture. In total, she has sold over 50 million albums, garnered 31 gold and platinum records, won 10 Grammy Awards, and has been inducted into our country's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. On top of being one of the most accomplished singers of all time, Linda has been an outspoken advocate on the rights of immigrants, the LGBTQ community, and the environment. Before I introduce her, let's listen to one of Linda's más hermosas canciones en español, Mi Ranchito. Corazón que te vas para nunca volver No me digas adiós Vuelve a alegrar con tu amor el ranchito que fue What a thrill to introduce a true luminary, Linda Ronstad. Thank you to the governor and the first partner. I'm very proud to be a part of this wonderful class, especially my brother musicians, Los Tigres del Norte, of whom I am a drooling fan. <laughs> and an extra special thanks to the folks at the California Museum. Thank you all. but certainly not least, is the most popular, hugely successful Norteño band ever. Los Tigres del Norte was started, in, yes. <laughs> 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 
I started in the small town of Rosa Morada in the state of Sinaloa, Mexico. The group found success and moved to San Jose, California to expand on their opportunities, and boy, are we lucky that they did. They gained wide popularity for turning corrido, the tradition of using story and song to celebrate the pursuit of truth, justice, and opportunity into an art form. Los Tigres have earned the moniker, the voice of the people, because they don't shy away from using their music to speak out on issues important to themselves and their community. Issues like immigration, racism, migrant workers' rights, the LGBTQ community, and more. When you listen to songs like La Puerta Negra, La Mesa del Rincón, and La Granja, you can hear the pride and respect that they have for Mexican culture, a culture whose people have not only helped build this great state, but who brings so much life and vibrancy to California. Their message and their music have been honored throughout their career, and to date, Los Tigres have won six Grammy Awards and 12 Latin Grammys. It turns out their greatness just might be genetic because Mexia and Giovanni Hernandez, sons of Hernan Hernandez, helped form Suenatron with their own Popteño sound, and we are lucky enough to have Hernan's kids here with us to play at the after party. <laughs> so it's an incredible honor to cap off our class with one of California's finest, Jorge Hernandez, Eduardo Hernandez, Hernan Hernandez, Luis Hernandez, and Oscar Lara, who is unable to be with us tonight. But let's celebrate Los Tigres del Norte! Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of my brothers and cousin, we would like to thank the governor and the first partner and the California Museum for this incredible honor. We are all happy and humbled to be included in this amazing class of 2022. The very first performance in this country was here in California. California has become our home, and after all these years, we are so thankful for the opportunities that this great state has given us. Finally, we want to acknowledge and thank our families, fans, and all those, those that continue to join us in our musical journey. Thank you so much. We, we appreciate it, all this. It's just amazing. Thank you. Okay, now it's my turn, but in Spanish. <laughs> I think I'm going to be the only one that looks like Spanish because uh, my brother George, you can tell that he's the serious one, right? <laughs> so, muchas gracias al, al gobernador y a su pareja por darnos este honor y también al museo. Y a nombre de mis hermanos, a nombre de Jorge, de Eduardo, de Luis y de mi primo hermano Oscar, eh, que no pudo estar hoy por razones, este, está un poquito indispuesto. Pero yo me quisiera tomar un momento eh, fuera de lo que estaba escrito para, para decir aquí. Quisiera que pasara Eric Angulo, hija de mi compadre Oscar, para que reciba la medalla de mi compadre Oscar. Si puedes pasar aquí, Erika, yo te la voy a. Yo le voy a prestar la mía mientras. Y este, nosotros llegamos acá a California en 1968 y pues desde entonces California nos abrió las puertas y California nos ha dado muchísimo y pues estamos muy orgullosos, primeramente de nuestras familias, luego de toda la gente que nos ha ayudado y pues la familia que son los que verdaderamente este, han aguantado nuestra carrera, ¿no? porque no es fácil eh, 
tener una familia y también andar en el camino siempre no es nada fácil. Y para mí en lo personal y creo que también para mis hermanos es un honor compartir eh, con este grupo de personas tan importantes, cada quien con su talento diferente, pero que han aportado muchísimo a, a California. Y lo que me sorprendió mucho hoy a mí es que el doctor Choi nos pidió un autógrafo hoy para una amiga de él. Dr. Choi, Dr. Choi pidió un autógrafo para, para una amiga que se llama María, se lo firmamos todos. Y eso, es, eso enseña eh, la humildad ¿no? de una persona tan importante. So that shows the, how, how humble is a person, you know, that, that gives so much to, to people, especially uh, make California proud. So thank you to our families, thank you to you guys, and we love you, and Arriba California. Gracias. El otro, permiso. Ay. Okay. Sí. Sí, sí, estamos muy entusiasmados. Okay, so please stand with me and let's give another round of applause to the 15th class of the California Hall of Fame. Thank you again to everyone who made this night possible. Protocol, my team in the First Partners Office, and of course the California Museum staff and board for your incredible, thank you uh, for your incredible leadership, Amanda Meeker, and also for Board Chair Ann Petri, Anne Marie Petri, and Vice Chair uh, Kristen Soros. And thank you again to all of the honorees, your family and friends for being here with us tonight. Um, and now I'm going to have my assistant uh, close out the evening. <laughs> Would you like to say a few words, love? <laughs> let's go to the after party. All right, let's go. Thanks so much, everyone. Congratulations. <laughs>